hey lovely people welcome back to the channel i hope you're doing great and merry christmas in advance in today's episode of how to build a compiler with llvm and mlir i'm going to talk about jit basics some updates as usual actually updates uh, is a strong word for this uh, for this one because two weeks ago i had a i had a bad incident and i lost my ssd drive I had a major data loss. I almost lost everything. And yeah, it was a major setback. I had to reorder my uh, reorder on the SSD drive, rebuild everything in advance, like move them over. It took me two weeks to get to here and actually be able to do some work. Unfortunately, I didn't push some of my changes you know, like in this project, other projects, and I lost some of my data permanently with I, I don't have I didn't have backup for them um I had like I have backups for the majority of my system like data and like uh, configurations and everything but uh but you know I have to reconsider my strategies a little bit but uh, the bright side is I actually had a chance to look at how things works and I had a chance to rebuild Serene from scratch again because you know when you work on a code base for so long you set up things in a certain way and you forget about some minor details i had to pull down the recent changes on uh, llvm and like build the recent version of uh, llvm not the stable version i mean like the development version i try to uh, work with the development version all the time so with the, uh, like when I get to the point that I can release the first version of uh, Serene, then Serene will be, will be based on the latest LLVM. So because of that and all the API changes in LLVM, I had to make some adjustment to the compiler and some, uh, I had to fix some of the issues uh, regarding to compatibility um and yeah that's it for uh i didn't do much in the past two weeks because of that incident um this episode is probably going to be our last episode of 2021 and obviously i'm going to continue recording this video video series in in the new year as well to be honest i didn't expect to be able to actually record 14 episodes and it kind of makes me happy but uh, because of like a, a special occasion that is upon me, I'm going to create a new video series uh, that is all about how to build a, a build an editor with Emacs Lisp. Like my editor is uh, all more than ten years old now. Um, I worked on it a lot, and I have a lot to share on this project as well. Like beside the, the compiler project, this thing is kind of my another ongoing project i have i work on it a lot because like i use it it has a few users um i already created a similar video series in another language and i got really good feedback so i was like yeah why not it makes sense to uh kind of reboot the video series in english this time hopefully it, it, it will be useful to someone who knows uh that's uh, that's the goal but right after this episode, I'm going to actually start recording uh, the first, the very first episode of that video series as well. Both of them are going to be in parallel, so it's not uh, it's not the case that I'm going to abandon this one or put more in energy on the, the other one. My main focus is in this, uh, like, is uh, my compiler project is Serene, and my secondary uh, goal is the other one. So that's enough. Uh, let's get to uh, to today's topic. What is just-in-time compilation? So to put it simply, it's just compiling at runtime. I did the air quote there because runtime is kind of a um, popular choice, I guess. Like the popular languages these days use. Uh, JIT at runtime, but it doesn't mean that you like 
there there's nothing uh, that prevents us from actually using a JIT in compile time or anything like that. And in fact, we're going to do that. So to put it in better way, uh, better words, uh, we can say just in time compilation is kind of compilation on demand. Whenever we need a piece of code, whenever we need to execute some code, we can compile that code just at the, right at the time that we want to invoke it. Usually interpreters and runtimes use JIT to kind of speed up things. Um, for example, Java, like Java J, uh, JIT is kind of famous. Some Python implementation have JIT, Lua has its own JIT to speed things up and it's done fast. Um, just to uh, kind of have an overview of how things is oops it doesn't look right uh okay sorry so at at very high level we have some sort of an input code we fit it to a jit engine and it spits out some form of a, like a target code and then we execute the result but that input uh, like that input code can be anything all right it can be like a regular source code it can be asd it can be a byte code or some sort of ir or whatever depends on the JIT implementation and the output can be again anything it can be a, like a native code it can be a, some sort of ir pretty much anything it, it can be even like a I don't know, like a JSON file, you know, to compile a stuff into a JSON. But the most important thing here is the JIT reads some sort of a code and generate the target code just at the time that we need the, that code to be compiled, right? To, uh, to kind of um, show you more details, I need to kind of come up with an example. This is just an example. It, it really depends on different implementations of a JIT. Like there can be 100% opposite of what I'm describing here, like opposite of this example here. But in general, the idea is the same. So let's imagine a JIT engine uh that is kind of similar like it that uses llvm stuff it's kind of similar to what we're going to do so that's why i use this example we have some sort of a source code in our case it's a staring code we pass it to a parser and we get some ast back we pass that ast to the semantic analyzer to make sure that it's semantically sound we we saw all this in previous episodes and then we enter the JIT engine, we pass that AST to some sort of a IR generator unit or component. We generate some IR either in MLIR or LLVM IR, doesn't matter, it's just an example. Then we use the pass manager to run some passes, make some optimizations, pass the final uh, kind of module to the object layer the object layer is kind of responsible to compile that thing to a, uh, compile the module to a native code and then link it at runtime with other libraries if it uses like an extra li external library and finally generate some native code then we either store it to a file as a like a bin executable binary or a shared library or execute the native code like invoke it this is just an example, right? The JIT engine can be simpler than this. It can be more complicated than what we have here. But just by looking at this graph, we can see that if we put more like too much passes in, the, in our pass manager, the process of compiling the source code to the native code is going to take longer because we have more passes to apply to the uh, RIR and it's going to take longer, right? 
also our object manager our language is going to have a, like a, a standard library it might it might not but let's assume it does our object layer probably needs to preload some of the shared libraries or what whatever format that we use for our standard library in advance before like as a startup process as part of its, its uh, startup process so um the bigger the standard library is the big, the, the longer it's going to take to for our jet engine to a startup and like we have to wait for its startup and depend like and depending on where we want to use our JIT engine, like is it a REPL environment? Is it part of our compiler? Is it in runtime? Depends on the sen different scenarios. It might like we come up with a di different trade-offs, right? So let's imagine a REPL uh, environment. User types some to actually to show you in real real time. This is like a Emacs list rep just because it's right there and i it's easiest to access right it's a rep environment if i write something here right i and i press enter i like the engine runs that expression for me and return the result right let's assume something like this like we have a rep environment if i type a, like a new expression here right and hit enter what happens is like it the engine parses the code and everything actually emacs has a jit itself so it can kind of it works <laughs> uh, it matches our example so what what happens is emacs parses my uh, expression it, to an ist does some semantic magic to it blah 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 and when it passes past that expression to our uh, to the jit if we Emacs JIT is based is not based on LLVM, it's based on libgcc JIT. I, I have no idea about that library, but obviously it's it might not have something like a path manager or uh, some similar concept. But let's assume it's based on LLVM, right? If we put too much too many passes in the path manager, there's going to be a longer delay between the, like uh, since the time I press enter till the time I see the result there's going to be a latency there like a larger latency and bigger delay which is not a good uh, user experience but if we run the JIT as part of our compiler it makes sense to do it because like if it takes more than few even few minutes who cares like the end result is more important than the compile time. Obviously, it would be nicer to have a, like a shorter compile time as well, but it's kind of, we can kind of ignore the, that fact. But at the same time, if we put like, if we use this JIT engine at runtime, this startup process, like preloading the core libraries can be like a huge deal. When we start the process of whatever language we have, we have to wait for a few seconds to for the object layer to load everything in memory or other type sort of magic it might does, right? So it's a tricky business. It's it's a, tr a trade off. We have to design our JIT engine based on what we really need and based on different scenarios uh, that we have. For example. Um, in Java, right? So Java has two different, like two main components. There's a compiler and there's a runtime, right? So there's like, um, when when we, in any JVM language, like Java, Clojure, Scala, Kotlin, whatever, all of them parse and like they work the same. They parse the source code, they run the semantic analyzer and all that, but their compiler job is to compile the source code to a bytecode, right? So when you end up with a jar file, that jar file is just a zip file full of uh, different bytecodes. Every class compiles to a bytecode, like a dot class file. And then at runtime, we pass that jar file and 
bytecode to a J, uh, JIT engine to a JIT engine and that engine reads the input like the input of that engine is the byte code like a java byte code and the output is like native code right so it, it's a jit engine uh, that runs the byte code generate native code out of the byte code and runs it right so it's like a two-phase operation in java so that's a dis design decision that the java team made and based on different scenarios we have to come up with a different uh, design no two JIT engine might be similar to each other and in fact like I tried it three times uh, with three different approaches that I'm going to talk about them in a bit and well each approach has some pros and cons but at the end of the day I have to see what works for me and what scenario is kind of the best for our own compiler so also, one, one more thing that I need to talk about uh, before uh, moving to why we need to uh, use a JIT is that um, there's a kind of a... I had this discussion with a friend of mine and he kept uh, comparing a JIT with, some, uh, with uh, something like Python with an interpreter. So... To, um, to clarify the situation, like they're kind of, they work the same, but they're not the same. When you pass a source code to an interpreter, that interpreter knows how to run that source code. So the actual, like the actual execution unit is the interpreter itself, right? But in the, in case of a JIT, JIT just knows how to compile that source code into some native code so some form of a target code and then asks the native platform to execute that right it, uh, jit itself is not the runner it can run the code obviously but it just compiles the input to an output and ask the platform to run it but in in, in case of an interpreter the interpreter itself is the it, like the unit that executes the codes it kind of the interpreter knows the instructions are uh, in the source code and like it might say okay this is an instruction one i have to do this this is an instruction two i have to do this but jit is like okay instru uh, instruction one two three i have to compile them to this thing and feed it to the platform to run it right so there's a difference uh, like a, it's easy to miss but it can be a like a deal breaker later on especially when we want to design our own engine so why to use a JIT first of all popular languages popular interpreters use JIT to make things to run things faster again air code because the speed is just relative you know in, in relative to what make it faster relative to what probably <laughs> relative to uh jit less kind of workflow um but it's again it's a trade-off just having a jit doesn't mean that it's going to run faster because the jit engine can have uh, like m some details that might make things even a slower um one other thing is to make uh to speed up the compilation the compilation process uh we're going to talk about it in a bit but uh, basically java is doing the same thing instead of uh, aiming like in, the java compiler instead of compiling everything to the native co code from the uh, like from the get-go it actually compiles everything to the byte code as i mentioned and later on use a, J a jet engine to compile that uh, to run that bytecode so it, it's kind of a shorter uh, process of generating some bytecode rather than generating the entire native code that can help as well also um, it's another approach that java compiler takes um, based on some runtime data we can choose some optimization that we might like our jet engine might do uh, on compilation time right sorry while it's compiling the 
input code to the target code. And finally, since ex again, uh, a Java example, by the way, I'm not a Java fan. To be, <laughs> to be honest, I don't like Java that much, but uh, there's a lot to learn from other languages, including Java. Another thing is uh, the way Java do does it when they generate everything, uh, when they compile everything to a bytecode and they pass around the bytecode and compile, use a JIT in the target platform to uh, just in time compile the bytecode to the native code. It means that just by creating the, like creating another JIT for another platform, they can support a new platform, right? In our case, that bytecode is kind of similar to our IR, so we can actually compile stuff to the binary format of LLVM IR, pass it around, and use a platform-specific JIT engine to run them. That way, we can like uh, easily add support for uh, new architectures, and so many other reasons. Uh, to use a JIT, but these were like these are the most important ones. Now, how are we going to use the uh, use the JIT? The first reason that we need a JIT, as I mentioned in previous episodes, can't remember which episode it was, but if you are working on a uh, working on a static compiler, like a, I don't know, like a language similar to C, C Go, Rust, or stuff like that, uh, like static languages, you don't need a JIT because your user will write some code, fit it to your compiler, you're going to compile it at compile time completely to native code, and just run that native code, uh, code and everything would be grand, right? But in case of a Lisp, it's a, a little bit different, right? I don't know whether you, you're familiar with Lisp or not. I highly recommend to learn about Lisp in general. There's a lot to learn. It's like amazing. But Lisp macros are amazing. I, I just can't say that. I have to show you, right? So let's go back to, let's create a buffer actually. Um, So, as you know, like if we, if I define a function to to understand macros, I, I first need to uh, tell you about functions. You already know about functions in any language, uh, but let's go uh, with a, like a really simple example here. Um, let's have a function that adds one to its input, right? I execute that function and then I can actually call that function. You can see the result on the bottom of my screen, right? Bottom left. As you can see, when I evaluate this expression, which is a function call, I call that function with uh, input, like the input value is four, it adds one to it and return five as the result. The entire process happens in runtime. So when I call a function, that function call happens in runtime. The difference between a macro and uh, function is that macros run on compile time, not on runtime. But uh, it might be a little bit hard to understand at first, but let's consider this example here. Um, mm, eh. Why not? Let's do it like this. Mm -mm -mm. Oops, 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 sorry. So, um, message. Oh, yeah. Or name for example right okay 
when i evaluate this uh, macro now i define a macro called abc1 it gets two parameters x and name if x is nil if it, x is nil it's going to return nil otherwise it's going to return message and replace the value of name it here like it's like a template right so if i run it let's say t um you you can see that it's like blah sound right To this point, there's no difference between a function and a macro. But the difference is, I can actually expand this mac macro to see um, what was the macro. Right. Yeah. As you can see, let me actually. Make some changes here. You can see the result on the right panel. So, if I run this code right now, as you can see here, this macro call, this function call, or macro call, better to say macro call, expands to this form, right? So, what happens is on the compile time when the compiler is trying to compile this code basically it gets to this gets to this macro and then it figures out that okay it's a macro i need to expand it it expands it to another form another expression and replace this call with that expression and then compile it again right uh it it, it does it till uh um basically it can't find any macro call again Right, so it resolved all the macro calls and end up with just pure ex runtime expressions. And finally, it compiled it and run it in our case, right? So in order to do this, in order to do this, we need to, uh, to have a JIT. I'm going to show you how it works in a bit. So we're going to have, like in all the uh, Lisp languages around, there's a concept of compile time versus runtime. Actually, it's not uh, specific to Lisps. Every compiler has, a, every language has a compile time and a runtime, every language that has a compiler. For us, in order to, sorry, in order to be able to actually uh, make things happen and be more flexible, we're going to make some abstractions and abstract the notion of compile time and runtime away from the language so in our case we're going to have a j uh, our compiler would be just a jit engine right as i mentioned before unlike static languages that doesn't need a jit like a jit engine in general we don't like we don't need to statically compile a Lisp. It's a dynamic environment, so we need a Jet Engine, and our compiler is going to be a just a big fancy Jet Engine. If we do this, if we have a, like a fancy, like a good Jet Engine running, we pass a sort like a certain source code to it. It's going to generate some native code that can, can be used both in compile time and runtime as well. So it's kind of makes this di distinction of compile time and runtime kind of blurry, right? Like we don't know w whether we are in compile time or runtime. Uh, it's just a good, it makes a good ab abstraction if we if we uh, look at our compiler that way. So again, to show you some pictures and graph of how it might work, as you can see here like this is in my head and it's like super simplified version of our jet engine we have some sort of serene ast when we read the serene code we turn it into a, a turn it into an ast and we make sure that it's semantically correct right and then when we pass it to the jet engine in inside the jet engine 
we kind of iterate through that AST, look for every node, look at every node in the AST. Is that node a uh, macro call? Like, are we calling a macro? If no, fine, add it to the JIT, generate the target code, and then based on the input parameter of the compiler, either generate a, like executable binary, like a traditional compiler or execute it right there, like a REPL environment, right? So, okay, uh, let's continue from here, uh, from this note here, and then I'll talk about the main point here. So if the node was a macro call, what happens is we're going to expand that macro. Expanding a macro means calling the, fun uh, the function that that ma macro describes. So, in general, a macro and function are exactly the same, right? They're just functions, but they run in different times. A macro is a function that takes whatever input you pass to it and generate another expression, right? We don't, we're not talking about the type system yet. It's going to make things complicated, more complicated. Let's leave that aside. It, like macros are pretty simple, exactly like functions, but they return expressions and they're especially because our JIT engine know that if we, if we call a uh, macro, it needs to replace the call to that macro with the returned exper expression. And then we're going to loop over uh, uh, through our nodes again. Right. If the return value of that macro was an expression and itself was a macro again, we're going to expand that one as well. So usually it might happen that uh, we're going to end up in a chain of macros and we need to expand all of them. If we uh, leave our abstraction out of the picture for a moment, the, like the simplest way I can describe it is that in compile time, we're going to run a JIT engine that makes sure that we have no macro call left in our AST, expands every macro call to the expression that it actually generates, and then compile the that AST into a native code, which is in turn is going to be like a executable binary, and we run that executable binary like any other executable binary for runtime at runtime right but now let, let's talk uh, about our abstraction if we kind of mix the runtime and compile time to, together and just have like a JIT engine that knows how to compile serine code then at this point when we generate some target code it's up to us uh, to like to decide what to do with it either store it either execute it, what to do with it, right? In a REPL environment, the, store, the AST is going to come from a, like a interactive shell. You, excuse me. Users, as I show you, showed you, users will like type stuff in the REPL and we're going to pass a, like a line of code, basically. We're going to pass that line of code uh, through the pipeline, it's going to be evaluated in our uh, just-in-time uh, compiler. It's going to be generated like uh, we're going to generate some code for it, and then we execute it just there, right? Invoke the generated code. But in case, like, if we decide to run the compiler uh, as like a traditional compiler, we can just store the uh, entire target code in a file right and the input code would be like f files after files of input like serine code and also by doing the, like doing this means we can run our JIT engine again in runtime you know users might like import the JIT engine set it up and run it to do some stuff with it basically since Lisp uh, like Lisp macros are really good and like a really nice way to expand the compiler um, because they run in compile time you'll see in the future that we're going to uh, 
when we set up the wiring of our compiler what we're going to do is to kind of lay down the basic foundations of a lisp like have some uh, create the macro system basically and then we're going to expand our compiler using that macro system and write our compiler in the setting itself but in order to do that we need a just in time compiler an engine to know how to generate code uh, out of setting code at runtime uh, sorry on demand also uh, one more thing before I move to the next uh, header um, having a just a just in time compiler have some advantages as well for us imagine we want to run our just in time compiler or jet engine as a traditional compiler we pass it like a code base to it and we ask it to compile it to target code and then we're going to store it in binary in native binaries or shared libraries or whatever right since it's going to be an on-demand compilation when we read the entire source code and we created the ASC and even like generate the IR for all the modules all the ASCs that we have we end up with few dozen modules or uh, I don't know any number right then in case of like an executable binary there's always a entry point to the binary right a main function for example we can ask the just-in-time compiler to okay invoke this function for me or co like compile this function for me and then it would be up to the just-in-time compiler to figure out what functions uh the main function are using is using and like it creates a, like a dependency tree of different functions like a control uh, like a control flow of the graph if you don't know what that is don't worry i'm going to talk about it in future episodes uh when we get to the time that we need like cfgs uh, sorry yes yeah, cfgs um so it's created like a control graph it can like eliminate dead code i don't know like just compile the stuff that we need for that entry point so i don't know we might have a project that has like 50 functions but depends on the entry point of that executable binary we might end up compiling only like 15 functions right like 10 functions uh, and those 10 functions only would end up in our uh final binary that's one other advantage of using a, a jet engine it, it helps us to make smarter decisions as i mentioned earlier but um how it works with llvm and mlir as i mentioned earlier i tried three different approaches um mlir itself has a jit that is based on llvm's uh, JIT library, like the org basically. I tried it, it's really good. The input is MLIR modules and you can generate native code with it. It works great, but had some limitations that might not be a good choice for us. That was the first approach I tried and I'm going to talk about it. We're going to have, a, have an episode about um, MLIR's JIT because it might be useful to other people and it's still a fun idea and a good idea to study the source code to see how they done it basically llvm itself has some jit implementations mcjit is deprecated i'm not going to talk about it at all i didn't use it because i i knew that it's deprecated and we shouldn't use it really there's a little jit um and lazy llg text actually right so llg is just a, like a jit engine that gets llvm ir modules and compiles them to native code lazy llg is uh, like a subclass of, of llg which is lazy it just compiles the stuff com uh, compiles symbols right when they get invoked right when we want to invoke them actually uh, we're going to have a look at both of them. Both of them are based on Orc version 2 uh, library. I tried both of them as well. They have, again, some limitation for scenarios that 
doesn't fit serene so i had to actually use the orc v2 api to create a jet engine myself i i i read the code of uh other like llg lazy llg and mlir jit and use their codes and their ideas as like a guideline for myself but yeah that's uh, what we're going right now it's not finished yet but i'm going to talk about that one as well it's a good practice actually to not good practice it's a good idea to learn more about orc v2 to learn like how layers work how to create a new layer blah 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 and uh, yeah i'm going to have another episode about that kudos to the folks in the jit channel of llvm they, they helped me quite a lot um just to give them a shout out here um they're great if you like during the during our episodes about jit if you had any question either ask me or just pop up to that channel and ask the folks there they're quite useful helpful and friendly this is it for today folks um in the future episode we're going to start with the mlir's jit first and move forward uh, in order that you, you can see right now so our own implementation is going to be last that way i'm going to have more time to finish it um if you have if you like my work please subscribe to the channel and consider to leave a like again merry christmas and have a fantastic time take care